Now, let's look at dealing with collectors. Now, you may be in here and you're not in financial trouble, but a percentage are, and this lesson is certainly for them. For some of the rest of you, you know someone that's behind, and you often enter into these situations where you hear about collectors doing things they're not supposed to do, and I want to educate you for that reason because I think the power of the marketplace can cleanse this industry that's out of control. And so I teach you with that in mind, and I want you to have information because those of us that have information have power. Knowledge is power in a knowledge-based economy, and that's what we're sitting in. And you may have a, a relative, you may have your 82-year-old grandmother's being abused by some collector, and then you'll know how to handle this situation. It's very powerful. I'll show you what I'm talking about. The best way to pay debts when you're behind is with a plan. Planning is wisdom. So ignoring it, throwing it all in a pile somewhere, if your bills look like me scattering these, these across here, then you're disorganized. No wonder you got a problem. Get organized, develop a plan, take control of what you can take control of if you're behind on your bills. And we'll walk you through how to deal with the collectors as you do that. Now you gotta remember when you're dealing with a collector, this is not your friend. Sometimes one of the techniques they use is the friend technique. They wanna be friendly and, and they're not your friend. They have one purpose for talking or dealing with you. One purpose, get money. That's their whole purpose. They don't care about any other part of your life. This is not your counselor. This is not your pastor. This is not your mama. They want your money. Don't be naive. And they play all these games. And they want to hear your whole story and all this. Every bit of this is a technique. This is a big, big industry and a sophisticated industry, and you have to have a clue when you deal with them. Don't be intimidated by these people. Collectors are basically trained salespeople and telemarketers. That's all they are. They average about 20 calls an hour. That's the norm. They contact out of 20 calls about six debtors, and they'll usually get about two promises. They run about a 10% promise ratio, and out of those two promises, I have no idea how many of them are fulfilled, but I bet most of them aren't. Smart Money Magazine says the collections industry, in terms of revenues produced by fees paid to collectors, is now over $40 billion a year. This is a big, big business, and it is a very, again, a very sophisticated business. But the people that are calling you are not very sophisticated. It is a very high turnover, low-paid position. You're dealing with an idiot in a cubicle 500 miles away with a headset on that has not been on the job very long. A recent article in Business Week said that 85% of the collectors are gone in a year. There's an 85% turnover ratio annually. That means they're not going to be there long. When you call back and they say, George isn't here anymore, they mean it. George isn't there anymore. <laughs> that's one thing that's not a technique. He is gone. He left. Why? Because I'd rather do just about anything than this job, wouldn't you? I mean, really, you'd just about go anywhere else than do this. It is not an honorable profession. It's out of control. So if you're running a collections outfit, really what you're running is a bunch of mean telemarketers that aren't going to be there long. What you do is hire and train full-time to replace the fallout because the attrition level is so high. It, the, the front door is a revolving door. They run, run in and run back out all the time. And that's who you're talking to. This is someone who couldn't get a decent job. And, and so don't act like that this is somebody that's, like, like, if you, like if I loaned you money and it was you and me, or, or you loaned me money and I didn't pay you, now that'd be personal, and if you were angry, it would mean something. But this is an idiot in a cubicle 500 miles away with a headset on. Keep this in mind when you're dealing with them because they start to have this presence in our lives. Big round one single eye in the center of the forehead. <laughs> and it's just these monsters are out there. And these monsters are maybe about this tall, sitting in a little chair, spinning around like the movie Office Space. I mean, there's just nothing there. You have to take the teeth out of these monsters and deal with this properly in order to do things. Now, because there's such high turnover, they're not very well trained. They get a couple of training classes, and they're taught basically one big technique, several little feeder techniques off the one central core technique. The core technique is they're taught to evoke strong emotion. If they can get you on the phone and change your pulse rate, they got you. That means that they made you afraid, they made you angry or any other emotion that is a strong emotion that you want to name. Usually those are the two big ones, fear and anger. And they're best friends, aren't they? 
Because right about the time I get afraid, I usually get a little angry. And that, that works together, doesn't it? They are really good at, at pushing your buttons. They'll use all kinds of techniques. One of the techniques is, is the pull the rug technique. The pull the rug technique is this. You step up on the rug, they pull the rug out, right? Now, the way that works verbally is they call up and they say, George, you're behind with us, and, and we can't believe you. Now, tell me what's going on. And George says, well, you know, it's, the kids have been sick. I've been laid off. We had a car wreck. My wife is in the bed in, in traction. And, and he starts telling the whole story of why they're behind on their bills. And about three or four sentences, five sentences into it, the guy yells into the phone, I don't care what's going on in your life. Don't you know you owe this money? When are you going to pay this bill? And you go, wait a minute, I was just... And, and it, it gives you mental whiplash, doesn't it? And what happens is people get mad. It makes you mad. It, it step up on the rug, pull the rug, and, and you go... He was just asking, and then I answered, and then he started yelling at me, and it makes you mad because he didn't care about your situation after he acted like he cared. It's a verbal barrage. It's psychological warfare. It is a technique, and these guys are really good at their techniques. It's, they're so good at it that they really create all kinds of problems. I was doing a, a live event one time in Phoenix, Arizona, and this beautiful lady came up front, and she said, thank you so much for teaching this lesson. I was teaching this lesson there. And I said, why? What, what's going on? And she said, well, I'm, I'm really, I'm current on everything, but I haven't eaten in two days. Because my dad told me, no matter what, I always protect my credit bureau report. That it meant everything. And I went, you haven't eaten in two days? I'm afraid of those collectors. They call and yell. Went, yeah, but you haven't eaten in two days? She said, I will now. <laughs> See, they use all kinds of techniques. Now, there is a spectrum of collectors. Let me just let me be very, very clear, because sometimes I get criticized and legitimately for, for not detailing this out enough, and I want to make sure I do. There's a spectrum of collectors from, from really professional good ones to just scum burgers, okay? And, and it works kind of like this. The best people in collections that we work with, the classiest, that know their stuff, that do not violate the law, that walk through the process, are people collecting on your first mortgages, you get behind on your first mortgage. They're going to call you, and when they call you, if they say they're going to shoot you, duck, the bullet's coming. If they say something, they mean it, and they don't, they don't bluff, they don't fool around, and they're going to get, they're going, we're going to move you into foreclosure. They're going to put pressure on you. They'll be firm. Sometimes they'll be a little mean, but they are very professional at their business, and the turnover rate with mortgage collections is not nearly as high as it is in other things. The next best collector is usually your small-town local collection agency. It's owned by someone in your town, and they're collecting bills for local merchants in the area. And again, they're usually more professional, and they're your neighbors, so they know they're going to see you somewhere. And they may get hit when they do if they don't behave. I mean, so, you know, there, there's a process. But they're very, I've dealt with a lot of those men and women that operate those things, and they're very good to follow the law, the Federal Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. They don't violate federal law very often. But then you move along, and it starts getting worse fast. Okay, and you can really get in some disastrous situations where you deal with like these little finance companies, these little storefront finance companies. A lot of the people that work in those are basically punks. And you will find that out when they start to collect from you. I had a single mom call me one time crying. She was at the corner market on a pay phone that I was counseling. And she said, I tried to go home, and when I got home, he was sitting there. And I said, what do you mean he was sitting there? This bozo was sitting with a folding chair in the front of her driveway so she couldn't pull in the driveway. You know, he's trespassing. Call the police. Tell them you're being threatened physically. This is a punk, out of control and violating federal law. The worst of the worst are credit card collectors. Chase, First Card, Bank of America, Discover, Sears, Pennies. I'm saying it on tape so it must be true. <laughs> Bad news. These household names, companies that otherwise we generally have some respect for, when you get to their collections department, violate federal law daily. They are completely out of control. They're credit card collectors. You can tell they're lying if their mouth is moving. If you're a credit card collector, you are officially scum. And if you don't like that, come see me. We'll talk about it. You're scum. We work with you every day. You have no clue what you're doing. You're out of control, and you're abusive. You're mean. You're wrong. You're nasty. You're an industry that needs to be completely purged. And we're about the business of doing that as fast as we can. We're going to do it. 
The company I work for issues credit cards. It is um, a major credit card issuer. There's um, an in-house collections department I worked in there. There was um, a front-end collections department that handled, uh, that's where I worked between five and 90 days past due. There were probably about two or 300 people that worked there at any given time. A lot of turnover, because just, just that, because hardly anybody you know, sticks around after training. The people who are penny past due, they would get a $29 late fee, and uh, their interest rate would also increase to uh, approximately 25%. That was the default rate at that time, 24.99%. Uh, there was one person on the floor who was a, a more aggressive collector. Nothing was ever done about her because she made she made you know the company look good, or she made the the department look good because she brought in a lot of. Uh, Check, uh, a lot of check drafts, a lot of post-dated checks, and that's what they like to see. It's unfair business practices, and what she was doing, she was lying to the customers. They said, anybody you know who is treating people like this, we want their names. And so I gave them her name, but they never did anything about it. I don't know why they ask about that. Management sat right there. They heard all of the phone calls. They know what's going on, and they just don't, they don't care. At that point, every day I felt like I was working for the devil. Like I was coming in and working for the devil. 9-11 is just one of those times, you know, you never forget where you are, what you were doing. And I was there in collections, calling, collecting on accounts. And then some of my coworkers came in and said, you know, and told us what was going on. And we're like, oh my gosh, you know. And so we all just stopped and we looked and our manager called a meeting. And she says, look, she says, I know what's going on, but we still have a job to do. So still get on the phone and collect. And we're like, what? <laughs> How can we do that? I sat there and pretended to. I wasn't going to do it. And another woman sitting next to me was crying because she says, I can't, I can't do it. And she, cause she was doing it. And she was getting screamed at, yelled at, of course, and by, by debtors. And like, what are you, you know, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> and, and it's like, and I wonder what was wrong with my manager telling us to keep collecting when, when 3,000 people were just murdered, you know? They do stuff like they'll change their names. I had, used to have one when I was going broke that would call me, her name was Mrs. Baskerville. <laughs> the Hounds of Baskerville. This is her pseudonym, right? Now listen, be, let me be real clear. I am not, nor have I ever in my career taught someone how to dodge a bill. If you legitimately owe someone, I want to help you get on a plan and pay it. But I don't want someone taking over your life by misbehaving, reprioritizing your life, and you walk up here and hadn't eaten in three days. That is wrong. Now, I want to walk you through a process where you can pay the bill and you can be honorable and you can have integrity. I am not going to assist in you dodging someone. That's not what this lesson's about. This lesson is about an industry that's out of control and how to put some shields up, some barriers up, so you can breathe while you work your plan to pay the people you owe. That's what this is about. We're not about dodging it. And the best way to counteract this technique of emotion is to always pay your necessities first. Then you set the order of payment after that. Necessities are food before you buy anything else. If you're working at all, you can buy food. Lights and utilities, keep your heat on. I'm not talking about a $148 cable bill. I'm talking about your water, your electricity, your gas, so you have heat and cooling in your house. Basic telephone service. Not a $92 a month cell phone bill either. That's not what I'm talking about. Basic utilities, necessities, food, utilities. Pay your mortgage payment. Do not pay anyone until you've eaten, kept your lights on, and pay your mortgage payment. You have to have a place to live. Pay your car payment if you've got a car and keep gas in the car. Food, shelter, clothing, transportation, and utilities. Usually if you're in a mess, you've got enough clothing to make it for a little while. You don't have to budget much for clothing. Usually you can hang on to that one. But take care of those things. Because here's the situation. If the lights are on and you've got a roof over your head and your car is running and you don't have to worry about the water being cut off, you emotionally are in a completely different place to fight your way through this because you're in the middle of a battle. And if you put those four walls up around you, you've got that emotional guard, and now the rest of it is a monopoly game that I'm behind on.